Hello, everybody. Welcome. It's very good to have you here with us again for one more of our virtual sessions of the Young Adult Ministry Leadership Formation Series that we began ages ago in a totally different world. Um, we're very happy to have you with us again. This is um, almost uh, the last session of the series. We will have one more in a couple of weeks. I will soon be sending you the information regarding that other session. And uh, tonight we are going to be talking about a concept that is present in the Christus Vivid document, uh, but that it's also very much present and has been present in the life of the church for centuries. And it's a, um, a concept that has a lot to do with us, with our personal lives, with our ministry, and with the life of our church, which is the concept of beauty. So again, uh, as you know, my name is Aaron Castillo. I am the Secretary of Director for Mission at the Archdiocese. I will be conducting tonight's session. The session is being recorded and will be later made uh, be made available through our website and our brand new YouTube channel. So uh, sign up, uh, join please uh, our channel so you can uh, take a look at all the, the different videos and materials that we're posting there. And, um, and let's get started. So Charles, who's helping us in the back end with all the, the development of the session, will pull up uh, the prayer that Archbishop Gustavo has placed into our consideration to, to be used during these times of, of tribulation. So we can start with, with this prayer. Um, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe, in these times of tribulation, we turn to you, O oh Mother. See with compassion the suffering of your beloved sons and daughters affected by the coronavirus pandemic throughout the entire world. Ask your son to have mercy on us, bringing healing to those infected and protection to all your children. Jesus Christ, Savior of all people, grant us courage to accompany and care for the entire world in the wake of sorrow and uncertainty. We seek refuge in you, and according to your promise, deliver us from this danger. Amen. St. Anthony of Padua, pray for us. Um, Charles, if you can habilitate me as a co-host so I can share my screen. There we go. Thank you. So, as I mentioned before, and again, it's great to see you. Uh, it's the, the topic that we're going to be analyzing tonight is the topic of beauty. And the notion of beauty is mentioned 23 times throughout the Christus Vivid document. Um, so just to give you an example, the, the name of Christ is mentioned 90 times and beauty uh, is mentioned 23 times. So it's not the central element of the letter as, as, uh, as we know. But, I mean, it's, it's a pretty good number. Uh, beauty plays an important role in what the Pope wants to say to the youth of the world when it comes down to what does it mean to be uh, a young Catholic. Um, so let's see in which ways does he use this, this notion, this concept. Because he, he uses this notion to, re, to, um, to reflect on different kinds of realities. Uh, and first, it starts with a warning. He, he talks about beauty as a possible trap, as a superficial or cosmetic kind of beauty that is used by the world. And here he's talking about those who only want your money and who want to become more powerful thanks to the money that you will give them. Uh, and and this, this use of, of uh, a certain kind of superficial beauty instead of liberating people leads them to a sort of enslavement the enslavement of always wanting to please the world, always wanting to have more material things that are considered beautiful and attractive and valuable by the world. And uh, again, instead of liberating us as beauty should do, this use of the concept of beauty, this cosmetic or superficial beauty, uh, draws us away from our vocation, our vocation to love. So there's this warning there. He, 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 he says it again and again. Do not be fooled by what the world calls beautiful. Um, take your time. Take your time to realize what beauty is really all about. And, and the other references to the concept of beauty throughout the document can help us understand what he, 
what, what, he's, uh, what he has in mind. Uh, there are a number of, of uh, paragraphs where the word beauty is used to describe God himself. And we will come back to some of these paragraphs uh, later uh, this evening. But let me say for now that for him, having had an experience of the beauty of God is precisely what, would sus what will sustain our entire Christian life. Think about the concept of encounter. Think about this notion of encounter that we have um, uh, made reference to over and over again throughout this month. Uh, this is part of the basic uh, element of uh, basic elements of a Christian life, and this is a basic element of Pope Francis's magisterium. He is constantly calling us to encounter God, to have a personal experience of His beauty and uh, of his love toward us. And he explains that it would be thanks to that encounter with him that we will be projected towards a loving encounter with the world. And it would be thanks to that dynamic of encountering God and then encountering others that we will be able to discover our vocation and live the life we are meant to live. So the, the, the notion of the beauty of God is essential because in a sense it's, the end that we are all seeking for in our lives. We're looking forward to encountering God face to face at the end of our lives here on earth. But at the same time, it's the starting point. Encountering the beauty of God right now, it's the starting point that we need in order to begin and, and, and relaunch over and over again uh, our, our history, uh, our personal story as, as sons and, and daughters of God. So. Uh, first, there's this reference to beauty as a possible trap, linking it to the notions of the world and how world explodes, uh, exploits a certain kind of beauty that is linked to uh, materialism and with commercial uh, uh, manipulation of our lives. And then there's this other element as a starting point and also as the end of our lives, which is the beauty of God. And then he starts talking about beauty connected to the human person. So he will say that beauty is a quality of each human person, every single person, just because of being a son and, God, and daughter of God, just because of having been created as a human person is beautiful. And this beauty is always appreciated by God. And um, let, let me say one more thing before I, I keep on uh, showing you all this, this different references to the notion of beauty. I believe that this concept of beauty can be used as a summary of the whole document. And it is my intention tonight to uh, walk you down, uh, go, walk you through the notion of beauty as it is used in the document and as it has been addressed by the church in other documents and moments. And, and uh, leading all of this conversation towards a possible suggestion on how to design or create a young adult ministry based on the notion of beauty itself. So again, the beauty, the beauty of God and the beauty of the human person as uh, something that God has created. Remember Genesis. Remember how God, after creating everything else, once he has created Adam and Eve, he would say, this is good. This is very good. And it is the only element that he created out of which he would not only say it's good, but he would say it is very good. And God is, is conscious of the beauty that he has created. He has created us in his image. And therefore, we are beautiful, uh, not only in his eyes, which we are, but in and on ourselves. Um, that there is a very beautiful reference to beauty as, as a characteristic of every age in life. He says that every age in life is important, and every age in life has its own beauty. And he would go on and explain that in the case of those who are young, uh, beauty would consist on... on living a life full of ideas, of hopes, of dreams, and great horizons. And in comparison, when you're old, this beauty is mainly marked by wisdom and experience. And remember that there is this whole chapter where he talks about how these two elements, the beauty of the youth and the beauty of the elderly, have to be combined in order for the church to be a whole, uh, 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 to, be, to be, yeah, to be able to act in uh, all the way in, to its fullest capacity. So uh, that's another notion linked to the ages of life. Um, there, is, uh, uh, there, there are several references 
to the beauty of the life of a witness to Christ, someone who lives his life in accordance to the calling that we have received to love God and love our neighbor. And he says that once you start living that kind of life, your life becomes beautiful and it's attractive and appealing to the eye of others. And we're able to transform the world through our examples, through, through our example, through our witnessing the action of the love of God in our lives and how that has moved us to transform the world. And then uh, still talking about uh, beauty, how beauty can be found in the life of, of people, of human beings. He talks about how beautiful the loving sacrifice uh, of, of a person can be when he gives himself uh, or, or, or delivers himself at the service of others. And he says that when we, when we do that, when we sacrifice ourselves for others, we are participating in the beauty of Christ on the cross. And uh, we will come back to this, this concepts because they're very powerful and they explain why beauty, beauty is so important to the church and to evangelization, as we will see in a minute. Finally, there are a few references to the beauty of the church. And he places an emphasis on the notion of the universality of the church, explaining that it's composed of distinct groups and there's a plurality within the church that gives us different faces and different traditions, different uh, liturgies. And all of that contributes to create a beautiful mosaic, uh, which reflects the richness of, of, this, of this body of Christ that we are part of. And he makes a reference to the beauty of creation. He says, the world we live in is beautiful and God um, has, has made himself present in our lives through the beauty of the world he has created. And finally, all of this, the, the beauty of God, the beauty of the person, the beauty of uh, creation, the beauty of the church, is, is a message that we have to communicate. And we have to communicate it along with the gospel and the Christian values that, that we uh, have placed at the center of our lives as followers of Christ. So these are just, and I'll send you this presentation so you can have the numbers. I strongly recommend you read them. They're beautiful. They're inspiring. And again, they're kind of a summary of the whole document. We are called to encounter God and by encountering God to discover our vocation. And our vocation has to do with giving ourselves to others in, in this uh, Christ-like life that uh, is capable of, of transforming the world by bringing uh, love into reality, a reality that was created by God and where beauty marks every single corner of, of, of his creation. Now, the topic of beauty is not a topic that is new to the church. On the contrary, from the very beginning of the history of the church, beauty has made itself present as an important element of the Christian life and of the life of the church. Think of the first Christians. Think of, of those who were being persecuted uh, during the times of the Roman Empire. It was 300 years, 300 years of living uh, in hiding, of being afraid of being persecuted, of meeting in secret uh, places in the catacombs in Rome. And nevertheless, they were already fascinating by the beauty of this message that they had received and that they had to transmit down to the point that they would uh, include in this very uh, secretive spaces where they met these kind of beautiful sculptures. This is a sculpture of the Good Shepherd that is found in the Domitila catacombs in Rome. And, and again, it's not only a beautiful sculpture, that it's created following the style of the Greeks and the Romans, but it's also the message that the sculpture itself transmits, the notion of a God that loves men and women and that uh, will go out of his way to, to find every single one of us once we, he discovers that we are lost um, and that he will carry us on, on, on his shoulders and care for us in our times of need. So it's both the beauty of the message, the reality of, of it all, because it's not only a, a beautiful story, but it's true. I mean, if that little boy that was born in, in Palestine in the first century was truly God, and if he truly resurrected on the third day, 
And uh, if he truly said that he would be with us until the end of times, then um, this whole message turns our lives into a beautiful existence. And uh, we have to celebrate that. We have to show the world that. So even in, in secret, even when we celebrate the liturgy together away from the eyes of the, of, of the world, they still manage to reflect that in this kind of beautiful sculptures. And as soon as Christianity left the catacombs, as soon as starting in, in the year 318, Christianity was allowed to be practiced publicly in the Roman Empire, Christians started to create beautiful churches, beautiful places where the community could meet and uh, encounter God, uh, following, uh, following the tradition that uh, had been uh, developed over the centuries and that had been lived in hiding and now could be lived in this open spaces. This is a picture from the Basilica of St. John Lateran in Rome which is one of the first cathedrals or, or first churches that the church ever built and which has been developed over the centuries. But here you, you would, uh, it, it's a beautiful place. I'm sure that many of you have been there. Uh, and if not, um, I, I hope that soon you are able to visit this place because you will be able to see how, for example, the mosaics in the floor date back to the fifth century, while this uh, element here in the main altar, this, this, uh, construction here dates back to the Middle Ages, and then the ceiling uh, comes from the Baroque times. So you see that Christians have been embellishing these spaces and making them more and more beautiful so they can reflect the glory of God, the beauty of God, ever since the beginning. And it's not only in, in architecture and, or, in, or with beautiful sculptures that this has been done. It has also been done with music. It has been done with literature. It has been done with paintings. And this is just an example of, of this. You know, this, this is a, a painting from Michelangelo Caravaggio, this wonderful painter, Roman painter from, from the Baroque era, at the very beginning of the Baroque era. He was the one who created uh, one of the elements that would define the Baroque when it comes down to painting, which was instead of, of drawing a beautiful background to the images that he's presenting, just to keep everything as dark as possible and then put uh, a, a one source of light that is clearly seen and then it illuminates the whole space. And that is called the chiaroscuro. He invented this and, and, and this man, uh, we only have a hundred paintings that he made and all of them are defined by this um, kind of, of, of technique and 60 out of those 100 paintings are of religious topics such as this one. This is the image of Saint Dominic, also the beautiful life of a Catholic saint who received a mission and lived it in fullness and transformed the world is celebrated here. So you have Saint Dominic, you see that he has the rosary in both of his hands. He's receiving it from Our Lady who in turn has Christ on her lap and she's telling him to bring this rosary to the world. And we see here, not only the rich man who paid for the painting, you can see it here, very well dressed and very elegant, but you will also see these poor people whose feet are incredibly dirty. And, and this painting is famous for this. This is the first time ever that in a beautiful, magnificent painting, feet were painted uh, with, with dirt because that's what Caravaggio was all about. He painted the world as he saw it. And, uh, and, and, and you see all this movement. And then you have this saint here, which is called St. Peter, St. Paul, sorry, St. Paul, uh, which is another Dominican um, uh, saint, a martyr. And so, so, so you have a whole narrative here. The saint is presenting Christ. Christ is presenting the Virgin. The Virgin is presenting St. Dominic with the rosary. And uh, the rosaries are given to the people. And this was part of this evangelization message of the counter-reformation in the 16th century. So art and beauty was used as a way to transmit a very powerful message, the message in this case of, of Mary's care for the world uh, through art. And this is something that, that the church is doing to this day. This doesn't stop. So um, probably some of you have also been in this place or you can recognize it. It's the beautiful Sagrada Familia Basilica in Barcelona, in Spain. And it's another proof of this uh, way in which the church has 
introduced beauty as a way to transform the space into a holy space and to invite the people who come in, believers and non-believers alike, to realize that they are entering a different world where they are open to transcendence. And that is what beauty is all about. And that is why these churches are still being built to this day in a beautiful way, knowing that it will take centuries for them to be completed. So, so the church has always taken beauty very seriously. And we are invited to, to do it today in our own lives, in our own ministry. And I want to, to bring to your memory some, a, a little video, and we're going to watch it again, that we saw a few months ago when we were talking about the affiliation and disaffiliation. We, we, we watched a, a little video that was presented by Bishop Barron in November uh, during the General Assembly of the USCCB. Um, and here he talks about beauty as an effective tool for the evangelization of a postmodern world, as an, as an effective way to bring uh, particularly young adults, disaffiliated young adults back into the church. So let's look at the video and you will see that beauty is not the only way he proposes as a means for us to be able to reach out to others and invite them to meet Christ, but it's certainly an important way. So let me switch screens. So we can look at the at the video. Here we go. Years to this issue of the unaffiliated, which in my judgment is the second greatest issue facing the church today, especially the uh, disaffiliation of our young people. So accordingly, I've had experts come in from uh, all kinds of different fields to help us understand this phenomenon of the nuns or the unaffiliated. So we've heard from sociologists, we've heard from uh, theologians, heard from catechists, teachers, analysts of the culture, uh, etc. And what I wanted to do was synthesize and gather a lot of this information in a way that would be helpful to all of you. So we put together, it's about 98% finished, a video, it's about 28 minutes long. We're, I'm not gonna show you the whole video. Uh, but it's designed not as a video of the conference to go out to the world, but a video from our committee to go to you to help you with this, uh, this issue. So as I begin the presentation, could I show you just a very brief three minute, a trailer of this video? We all set? Okay. So do you believe in God? No. I do not. No, I do not. Same here. Years ago, we could confidently assume that Catholics would come to the institutions of the church, but today the number of the disaffiliated rises to a staggering 24% of our country. Half of American Catholics leave the church at some point in their life. The rates of non-affiliation continue to go up. The church is failing to engage young people. This is not business as usual. There's something dramatic and something catastrophic going on. Church people are very quick to offer explanations for the phenomenon of disaffiliation, but we don't really have to guess. Lots of people have told us precisely why they've left. I just never really understood it. Science took over, logic took over. I don't feel different there. 80% of them leave before they're age 23. The median age at which someone leaves the Catholic Church is 13. Many did not know what they were leaving. They simply joined that train. We're talking mostly about people who think religion has nothing to offer them. Now we come to the central question. How do we get them back? Young people want to do something good. They might not believe all the words that they hear the church speak right now, but seeing something good done will speak to their heart. They will resist moral arguments because they will say, well, atheists can be good people too. But beauty is subversive. Beauty gets under your skin. A lot of people are scared of going into this landscape, the social media, but the Catholic voice is needed there desperately. Young people do not want Catholic light. They can handle Catholicism. Holding back on the teachings of the church is doing a grave disservice to our young people. Every single person is called to be a missionary disciple maker or an intentional disciple maker because that's the calling of baptism, to fulfill the great commission, making disciples of all nations by fulfilling the great commandment, loving God and loving neighbor. Is this affiliation 
the end of Catholicism and Christianity. No. The disciples on the boat with Jesus. And there's waves and there's a big storm all around them. Peter sat out and could walk on water. As he started to notice the storm that was raging around him, he started to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. If it feels like we're in a storm today, it's no less than the one the disciples faced. And the only way we can weather the storm is by stepping out of our boat with our eyes fixed on the risen Jesus. The time we're passing through is serving as a summons to a coterie of catechists, evangelists, and witnesses willing to give their lives to the great task before them. That's the challenge, and that's the great opportunity. Okay, so um, as you might remember, we, we saw this uh, maybe three or four months ago. And again, um, within those, those paths through which we can reach out to those who have left the church, beauty is listed as a prominent one. And, and this is no, not new for the church, as we have mentioned it. This has been there from the very beginning. And it's just a natural reflection both of the beauty with which God has created the world and the beauty of the action, of the saving action of, of our Lord Jesus Christ through his life and then uh, through the church throughout the centuries. So, um, so we, have to, we, we have to take this into consideration. And what I want to do in the rest of, of, the, of the presentation is um, just to, to, to explain a little bit more about how the church has reflected on the notion of beauty in, in recent years. So in 2006, Pope Benedict XVI uh, presided over a general assembly of the Pontifical Council for Culture. And the final document from that assembly was titled The Via Pulcritudinis, Privileged Pathway for Evangelization and Dialogue. And Via Pulcritudinis means exactly the way of beauty. And in, the, in that document, which is very profound and very beautiful, it is, it is explained that beauty uh, is located or can be found not only in beautiful works of art like the ones we saw, like the sculpture we saw from the Domatila Catacombs or uh, at the St. John Lateran Basilica or uh, at the Caravaggio painting or at the Antonio Gaudi Basilica, but also in nature, in liturgy, and through the lives of those who have been touched by grace and therefore have lived life to the fullest, which are the lives of the saints. He says that uh, art can be beautiful, nature is beautiful, liturgy has a particular kind of beauty that transforms and changes our lives, and that is why it's so important uh, to, the Christian, to, to, the, to, to the Catholic Church. And then the beauty of the lives of those who live their life in accordance to the, to the commandment of love. So, uh, again, Benedict the Sistine giving, giving us an idea of how powerful art can be as a means for us to be able to discover transcendence and change our ways. Um, back in 2009, he invited 250 artists from all over the world. Again, musicians, architects, sculptors, painters, people from very different uh, world, parts of the world, different religions even, and he just wanted to talk with them about the ability that beauty has to touch human existence and transform it. And then he explained to those that were present that they had a very particular mission, and for those who were believers among them, that that mission had to do with the mission to bring Christ into the world. And he said this, this, this little portion of that, that speech, which is uh, worth reading. It says, beauty has the capacity of giving man a healthy shock. It draws him out of himself, wrenches him away from resignation and from being contact with the hemundry. It even makes him suffer, piercing him like a dart. But in so doing, it reawakes him, opening afresh the eyes of his heart and mind, giving him winds, carrying him aloft. Uh, and and this is a this this is an experience that we can have in our everyday life. You know, when, when we listen to a beautiful piece of music, where we when we go to a Sunday liturgy, or or, or, or right now we watch through 
the, the, the live streaming a beautiful liturgy. Uh, I'm thinking back on the uh, Eastern celebrations that took place in the Vatican, for example, my wife and I watched those, uh, or the ones that took place at the San Fernando Cathedral. And, uh, and liturgy itself, it's just so beautiful, and these religious spaces are so beautiful and overwhelming that they have the ability to touch us very deeply and to, to recenter us, to reconstitute us. And, and that is why our churches have to be beautiful and we have to make an effort to, to bring that beauty into the life of those who approach them. And then that's the same thing that happens with all of all this uh, other manifestations of beauty through art. Um, nature. Think about places where you have been and, that you, uh, and where you have been truly touched by nature. Think of a concrete place uh, where, where you have been really moved by the beauty of the place that you're at. Uh, in my case, my, the first thing that came to mind when I was putting together this PowerPoint presentation was um, a, a place in southern Mexico where I'm from, a place called Chiapas. And there is this, this natural park there called Aguasul that has all these waterfalls uh, that are just absolutely beautiful. And now think of what is it that you feel when you are uh, in, uh, surrounded by nature. And maybe you thought of being on the top of a mountain or in front of the sea or in front of a beautiful sunset or you were thinking about uh, walking down uh, the Grand Canyon. Or, and, and what do you feel when you're there? This document by, by um, the, the Council of Culture uh, explains it uh, with a reference to the notion of the sublime. Uh, it, it says it's, it's a little different than beauty as we can find it in art. Usually a piece of art is small and manageable, while nature is just huge and overwhelming. And therefore it gives us a different set of feelings. It makes us feel small, it makes us feel inspired, overwhelmed, and, and also resolved. Encountering nature allows us to realize that we have to live a different kind of life, that we have to go back to nature more often, that we have to live in harmony with that beautiful world. And, uh, and nature is also an opening towards the transcendent. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, the document explains um, it is believed that God created the world. Here we have this image from the 16th chapel where God is creating the sun and the moon. And, and in, in accordance to this tradition, God placed uh, his, his, um, his imprint in, in, in the creation that came out for, from his will and his, and his love towards this new world that he was creating. So we can find him or a reflection of him through nature, and that is why it's also a place of conversion. That image that I showed you a few minutes ago from the Sagrada Familia Basilica in Barcelona, uh, the inspiration for that basilica came to the architect Antonio Gaudí from uh, the experience of walking down the forest early in the morning as the sun was rising, and then light started to, to come in uh, through the branches and the leaves, and it just illuminated the space he was walking through in such a beautiful way that he imagined that as an, uh, as an image or a meta metaphor of God's grace uh, flooding the world. And he said, I want to create a space where people will be able to experience this. Not only the beauty of nature and how light comes in uh, uh, inside a forest at the early hours in the morning, but also of that being an image of how God loves us and is constantly caring for us. And, and that is precisely the feeling that you get when you visit the Basilica. You get this, to, to see this, this cascades of light that create such a beautiful space. You know? and, and this happens in many of our churches. You know? um, there are beautiful spaces that have been inspired in encounters like this, in this case, an encounter with nature. There is a very famous uh, sermon, the Sermon 241 from St. Augustine, and he, he, he talks about this. He says, question the beauty of the earth, question the beauty of the sea, question the beauty of the air, amply spread around it everywhere. Question the beauty of the sky, question the, ser the serried ranks of the stars, question the sun making the day glorious with its bright beams, question the moon tempering the darkness of the following night with its shining rays, question the animals that move in the waters, 
the amble about on dry land that fly in the air, their souls hidden, their bodies evident, the visible bodies needed to be controlled, the invisible souls controlling them. Question all of these things. They'll all answer you. Here we are. Look, we are beautiful. Their beauty is their confession. Who made these beautiful, changeable things, if not one who is beautiful and unchangeable? So it's this idea that through the act of creation, God left a mark in the creation, it's in creation itself that leads us towards him. And that is why nature has also this ability to, uh, to, to lead us towards transcendence. So first, art. Second, nature. Third, um, ah, one more thing. Uh, the document explains that after being in contact with nature, we leave with this uh, very vivid uh, feeling of peace, of harmony, and the desire to live a beautiful life. And the third uh, place where beauty can be found in our lives is liturgy in accordance to, to the document. So what is liturgy? Liturgy is this actions that we make in order for us to be able to enter in, to, to encounter God, to transcend the present and this world and put it in connection with, with God himself uh, by doing what he has commanded us to do, by allowing Christ to, to keep on acting in his church and um, that is why, again, beauty has to be well taken care of and it has to be beautiful because it has this mission of allowing us to encounter God himself. Um, Pope Bennett would like to tell the story of uh, a Russian prince that was uh, pondering whether or not he and his people should convert to Christianism. And he sent a couple of envoys to, to uh, to Vicentium to, to take a look at the Cathedral of St. Sophia and uh, to see if God was there present. And according to the story, when they came back, he asked them, is God present among these people? Should I become a Christian? And one of his envoys answered, God has built himself a home there where he can meet his people. And that is what our churches and our liturgies are all about. It's a place where God is uh, that, that we create along with God in order for us to be able to meet with him in a very particular way. These churches and these liturgies are used to evangelize. Here is a beautiful image of uh, a 16th century church in England. It's the chapel of the um, King's College in, in Cambridge. And uh, a beautiful thing about this chapel is that you see two sets of stained glasses and each one of them tells a story. The upper portion of each uh, section has a story, tells a story that comes from the New Testament. And then the lower section tells a story that it's connected to this New Testament story, but that comes from the Old Testament. So this beautiful stained glasses, and this is a huge church, are created, were created in order for them to be able to tell the Christian story, to allow people to be evangelized, to be catechized, to uh, learn the story of, of Christ and his church, and, and then uh, make it a part of their lives. And, uh, and, and yes, of course, our liturgies and our churches are used for this, but more importantly, they're used for us to be able to encounter with the mystery itself, with the mystery of God, to encounter God. And, and uh, of course, this is an image of St. Peter's Basilica, the main altar there, where, where this huge world was created so the Pope could celebrate the Eucharist down here, you know, the liturgy of the Eucharist. And, and, and this whole building talks about the beauty of what's happening in this altar. Right? There's a connection between this artistic beauty and then the mystery that it's making itself present. And we know how much, uh, what a large impact they, this can have in the life of, 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 of people, and particularly youth and young, young adults think about the natural um, desire of, of encountering uh, God and, and beauty and love, and, and how that, for example, creates a, a very interesting interest in, in the Eucharist and, and holy hour and an invitation for adoration people react to that you know? they want to learn and they want about the mystery and they want to be in touch with the mystery and then finally the beauty of people especially those who have been transformed by the love of god and who are, we call our saints or the saints 
So what are we saying when, uh, when we say that a person is beautiful? And the document explains that there are different uh, ways in which we, talk about, we can talk about beauty in a person. There's physical beauty, and then there's a certain ontological beauty and a personal beauty. And I'll explain the, the difference here. But before the physical beauty, uh, I go back to what Pope Francis, or we, what we said that Pope Francis says in Christus Vivid at the very beginning, uh, physical beauty, if you just link it to the notion of, of a young buddy, then it can become a trap because that passes. No time goes by and that kind of beauty is lost. Uh, and there's, and that's why we must understand that each season in life has its own beauty, even its own way of, of, of projecting uh, physical beauty in accordance to that particular age. And that is how we can talk about a beautiful old lady or a beautiful old man. And then this ontological level of beauty in the person, it's the beauty that we share with everyone just because of being humans. And we've already made a reference out of Christus Bibit uh, about this kind of beauty, this beauty that we all share as sons and daughters of God. But then there's an element of a personal beauty. Each one of us is unique. Each one of us is, has a name, a story, a biography. We were born in different times and places and nobody else is like us, and nobody else has ever been like us, and nobody else will ever be like us when it comes down to this personal identity. The, this is painting here, it's a painting from a Mexican painter named Germán Gedobrius, and it's the image of a, of a, of a Mexican woman, uh, an Indian woman, who is um, in, in the company of, of her child, of her uh, newly born, and you can see that she has here the little toy that he's, she's using to entertain him. And she has her rosary here. And this for sure is an image of her lady. And she's just looking at that little baby that has its hand on her chest with, 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 with the love of a mother. And the love of mother is the, the love that penetrates the soul of the loved one. And she knows him as nobody else does. And that's the way that God looks at us. And that's the way that he loves us. Um, and, and Christus Vivid says, God lets us know that he sees in us a beauty that no one, no one else can see. For you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. So uh, there's the, the, that's a different kind of beauty. There's the beauty that we share with others, and that there's this particular beauty that comes from our identity. And God is in love with that particular identity that he has given us. And then there's another level of beauty, this moral beauty where holiness takes place. And Benedict the Sixteen says, the saint is the one uh, who is so fascinated by the beauty of God and by his perfect truth that he's progressively transformed by it. So um, how, how is holiness achieved? It's through this process of, again, encounter. We encounter the beauty of God that the Pope talked about and we mentioned in the beginning, and we are transformed. We're willingly, we accept to be transformed by that beauty. And then we're, we're, we're transformed uh, into, into people that look uh, like God more and more. Mm -hmm. and, and that is what, what uh, holiness is all about. Here's an image of Mark uh, Escher, this uh, Dutch um, painter that used to create this illusions, optical illusions. And uh, you don't see, you, you, you cannot see when it's going up, when this staircase is going up and when it's going down, it, it does the same thing simultaneously. And this is just to reflect on the idea that God loves us first and we accept that love. We act on the basis of that love and therefore we are transformed uh, by that love and that draws us closer to God and then that transforms us again. And it's a constant process of growing and that's the, the, what the spiritual life is called to, to be. Um, it says in Christus Vivid, if in your heart you can learn to appreciate the beauty of this message, the beauty of, of, of the love that God has for us, if you're willing to encounter the Lord, then you will have a profound experience capable of sustaining your entire Christian life. So again, this, this particular kind of beauty, the beauty of the person whose life has been lived to the fullest because it has been transformed by God's love begins with the constant encounter and re-encounter with God. And, and, and uh, this other quotation also from Christus Bibit kind of underlines 
the need for us to answer and to allow ourselves to be transformed by the beauty of that encounter. It's, the Pope says we must dare to be different, to point to ideals other than those of this world, testifying to the beauty of generosity, service, purity, perseverance, forgiveness, fidelity to our personal vocation, prayer, the pursuit of justice and the common good, love for the poor and social friendship. So there's a whole program of beauty there. It's not artistic beauty, it's a different kind of beauty. It's the beauty that comes from living the Christian life, from being touched by God's love and transforming ourselves into instruments of that love. This is a famous painting from Van Gogh, uh, the, the Dutch painter, uh, from his very early stages as a painter. And it's a very beautiful image. It was painted at the time where he was a Christian minister in Belgium. And he lived among very, very poor people. And one evening he was invited to have dinner at this house. And he looked at, uh, uh, he, he took a look at how this family looked like. They were all poor, they were all tired, they were living in a very poor house. And nevertheless, you get to see in their eyes both tiredness and despair, but also interest and self-giving. You have these gestures of, of service being rendered one to the other, and, and he celebrated the beauty that's in there. And Pope Francis loved that, and he says, there is beauty in all of those men and women who pursue their personal vocation with love, in selfless service of community or nation, in the hard work of building a happy family, in the selfless, selfless and demanding effort to advance social harmony. So all of, this, it, it, all of this is part of that beauty that we're called to, to live, to embody, and also to use as an evangelization tool in our encounter with others. So remember, when we're doing a ministry with young adults, there is this deep desire in everyone's hearts for, for encounter with love. We have been created for love. We're looking for it and a way in which it appears, in a way in which love makes itself present in our life is through beauty and through all of these different channels of beauty. Um, this, this, um, this painting by Lorenzo Lotto, a painter from, from, the, from the Renaissance, an Italian painter from the Renaissance, it's all about a conversation, an encounter. And, we, and when we see the saints talking with Our Lady and with uh, baby Jesus, you want to be a part of that, of, of, of that conversation. You want to know what is it that they're talking about. And that reflects the nature of our heart. We are made for encounter. We're made for love. We want to be a part of, of, of uh, a heavenly conversation. And beauty is a, a way through which we can encounter or enter that conversation. This is uh, another painting by, by an Austrian famous painter, Gustav Klimt. And uh, it has three elements to it. It has this tree, which is called the tree of life. This bird here represents death. So we're living and our life is large and complex but it's also marked by the fact that one day it will end. And then it has th these other two images. This one over here is called expectation. And this one over here uh, is, is called realization. So we are all expecting an encounter with love. You can trust that everyone you work with is looking for God's love and they want to move. We want to move from here to here constantly. And that is why um, using uh, the different means of, of beauty as a way to, to speak to the soul of our friends, of those who we work with, is so important. Finally, how can a young adult ministry be built around these ideas of artistic, natural, divine, and moral beauty? Uh, how can we make all of this part of what we do? I have a suggestion for us here in San Antonio, which is let's go to our missions. Let's organize pilgrimages to our missions here in San Antonio, our four beautiful missions, because everything that we just mentioned is there present. They have these beautiful components of art, both in the facades, in the interiors, in the paintings. There is this whole history about how they were built and with which purpose, and all the pain that the, ones, the, the people that lived there had to go through in order to create this wonderful uh, spaces where civilization developed in what turned out to be our city. Then you have uh, nature surrounding it and you can walk down the river walk from one uh, mission to the other and it will provide, if, if you do this with, with uh, 
the young adults in your in your groups the, it will provide you with an opportunity both for conversation but also for prayer and for the encounter with the sublime as we mentioned before this encounter with nature that makes you feel overwhelmed small uh, that 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 helps you to recenter yourself to refocus yourself and we all need that right now very much and then finally uh, liturgy keeps on taking place there they were des designated as, as world heritage sites because they are living spaces. You know, culture is still being, being developed there under the form of ongoing Christian life. So you can go there for mass or for any other ceremonies or just for prayer with, with your groups. And that would be a beautiful way to, to encounter the beauty of liturgy. And, and finally, the stories there, right? Starting with, for example, in Mission San Jose, which is the one that we're seeing in the picture here, the story of Fray Margil de Jesus, it's just amazing. This, this friar that, that walked uh, throughout the Americas, you know, Central America, the whole of Mexico, and all the way up here to what turned out later to be the United States to, to share this beautiful message of Christ. Uh, I mean, the, the story of this saint is just beautiful. And the story of the missions, again, is very inspiring. Now that, now that, now that we're living challenging times, knowing that these churches are still there, that they're still open, that liturgy is still being celebrated there, should be a source of hope for all of us because they are a living proof that, that we can overcome all these difficulties and that God is with us and that a whole, uh, a whole city uh, has been able to, to, to sustain itself through these troubled times uh, thanks to all of these elements, right? So visit the, the, the missions and take advantage of them as a place where all these sorts or channels for the encounter with beauty can be found. And, and finally, again, this, this famous quotation from St. Augustine, God has made us for himself and our heart will remain restless until we uh, encounter him. So beauty is a way through which we can help ourselves and others to encounter God. And that's it. That's, that's uh, the presentation I prepared for you based on what the Pope says on beauty. Um, we have a few minutes in case you have some questions or comments. And, and thank, you, thank you very much for joining us for this almost last session. You can raise your virtual hand. You can use the chat if you want. Okay. Well, um, then I have nothing else to say, but uh, to thank you again and to let you know that uh, we will be sending you the invitation to our final session. Um, there's a comment on the chat. But for some reason, I mean, thank you for your presentation. At time so fast to process, so much great info. Uh, you're welcome, Sister Christina. So, I mean, uh, I'm sorry if I went too fast. Remember, the idea is very simple. The beauty of God transforms us. We are made for, that, that, for the encounter with that beauty. Once we have been transformed by that beauty, then we become instruments of that beauty in the world and we can help others encounter God through this, this beauty uh, and by allowing them to to enter in contact with uh, art, nature, liturgy, and the beautiful lives of those who have lived their existence to the fullest touched by God's love. So thank you very much and have a good night and see you in a couple of weeks for our last session.